clicked out of something. Shoot. Um, Barb, you okay? So I, I just clicked out of something. What did I, uh, no. Shoot, good, I'm sorry. good morning, Go everyone. My name is Don Hicks. I'm an HR and risk management consultant, as Stephanie and Jacqueline mentioned with, with Shakely, but we are very proud of our partnership with the Madonna Chamber. So um, thank you for joining us. I know it's a very stressful time for everyone. And I really want to make this collaborative. I want to make it engaging um, and get your, get your questions answered as much as, as much as we can, as much as I can. So there may be some questions you have that will require a follow-up after this meeting, and that's fine. So I will reach out to you one-on-one -on -one if you want to talk about things personally or not in this group setting, but we want to make this um, very valuable for you. So, um, so thank you again for, for joining. A little, about, uh, a little bit about me, you can see on the screen there, but, but before we get into the, to the presentation, a, cu a couple of things I wanted to mention. Um, I will be giving out a $25 gift card from me to your favorite local restaurant for the person that engages the most, whether it's through chat or video or answering questions. So I want to make this very interactive, but also put an incentive in place to support our local restaurants particularly going through this virus. So $25 gift card uh, for the one that engages, engages the most. Um, also, please share your stories. If you have ideas, suggestions, I wanna make this collaborative. The things I'm going to be talking about hopefully will give you some tips of how to think about business strategies in dealing with some of these issues. But more importantly, um, we wanna share some stories. So if there's things that you are doing uh, that you want to talk about, that you want to share with the group, um, engage with the group, feel free to do that. We welcome that and I welcome that as part of this presentation. So feel free to stop me if you have any questions, raise your hand in the video chat or, um, or chat if you have a question. We are monitoring those. And uh, again, thank you for joining. So uh, a little bit about me. I, I think I know a lot of people that's on this, on this call, but I've been working with businesses now for over 20 years. Uh, so I have a lot of experience in dealing with businesses and, and the struggles and challenges they are dealing with, you know, in good times and in bad. And unfortunately, we're going through a, a very bad time. So with my background and some of the experiences and some of the things that I help businesses with, hopefully you will take away some, some nuggets of, of information that you can use. But more importantly, as we all deal with this in the days and the weeks to come, feel free to reach out to me and we can talk through some of these things um, I have various partnerships and networks throughout the Cleveland and Madonna area. So if I can help you directly, I will try to, to point you in the right direction. So feel free to use me in that resource and use some of that experience. So next slide, please. This is the agenda. So again, feel free to stop me if you have any questions, but we're going to talk about the phases, the different phases in dealing with this vir virus when it first started. So we're going to talk about more uh, prospectively, like what does the future look like and what are some of those strategies, strategies now and look into the, into, the, into the future. We're going to talk about some of the business stages in dealing with this virus. I talk to multiple businesses, some per day, uh, multiple businesses per week. So I will be able to share some of those anecdotes with you of what I am hearing in the marketplace, what questions we are getting as an organization and more importantly, what are some of those strategies that companies are putting in place to deal with this stuff now, but again, going into the future. And again, that's the third bullet point, the best practices, strategies, and ideas. The focus is the ideas. So again, if you have questions, wanna share some of the things that you're working with, let's please make this engaging and, and collaborative. So next slide, please. The phases, let's talk about the phases. Next one. Okay, we probably have all heard this, but we are all living in a time that what, what was once certain is obviously now un uncertain. That is the environment that we all are living in. And in dealing with businesses and working with businesses and talking to business owners over the last three, three and a half weeks, maybe a month, these are the different phases that we see our, ourselves in. Um, the first phase was everything stopped. And we all been, been through that. I know my phone stopped ringing three, three and a half weeks ago. Um, it, it, everything was eerily just stopped. The, the second phase that I find that businesses and everyone was in is we were just in shock. 
it was just, oh my God, now what? Now do how do we deal with this? And I think right now we are in the third phase and going into the fourth phase. The third phase, I find a lot of businesses finding themselves in is just learning how to deal with it. It is chaotic. We are dealing with uncertainty. Um, we are all trying to interpret the federal and state guidelines. Um, we are applying for uh, the Paycheck Pro Protection Act and other um, uh, legislative things that the uh, federal government and state government are uh, putting out there. So we're trying to interpret that. More importantly, if you are a business owner and obviously part of an organization, how do you engage with employees? How do empl employees engage with you? And we're all trying to learn how to work remotely. How not to work remotely? When do you come into the office? How do you protect yourself? So we're all learning how to not only engage with the public, but engage with um, our federal uh, former, not former, our uh, fellow workers. We're also determining as businesses and business owners, determining the impact on our revenue channels. You know, So I'm dealing with this now, but how do I deal with this? And what does my revenue look like in the next 30, 60, 90 days? and obviously determining what the future looks like. Now what, now what do I do? Now the fourth phase is something that we're gonna spend a lot of time talking about because I, I'm not sure we are thinking about that as a society is um, when things do reopen and there's talk of reopening things sooner than later. So when things do reopen and, and try to get back to normal, what does that look like? And more importantly, as an HR and risk management professional, what does that look like and what kind of risk is involved with that? What I see and what we are counseling our clients on is protect yourself. Protect yourself from that phase when things reopen and hopefully you will take away some things that you can just think about. I wanna challenge your thinking. I wanna give you some ways to re uh, rethink things, maybe things that you've done in the past and the way you've done things in the past. And, re and just think about the risk that's associated with what the future looks like in this new normal. So when things do reopen and we get into that fourth phase is what one of the things and one of the challenges that we see and that I see is potential for litigation. So I hope that doesn't happen, um, but that, that is something that I see as a risk. Um, and I am trained and paid to sort of think for my clients and think for the worst and help them prepare for it. That is what my profession and my professional training and my collegiate training is designed to do. So the litigation uh, potential, let's talk about those, um, those items for, for a little bit. Um, those exposed to the virus, now I don't know if some in your organization are dealing with that, hopefully not. But th those that are exposed to the virus or think they may be exposed to the virus or know a family member that's exposed to the virus, the question becomes is, is how do you as an organization or a, a business owner, a leader, or part of an organization, how do you deal with that? Do you have the right policies and preparedness in place to, to deal with that? WFH uh, work from home. Um, and RTW return to work policies. Um, one of the things I'm hearing is there's some challenges with employees that want to work from home, but you may need to get to a point you're gonna have to bring them back. Now, if you have a situation where they wanna continue to work from home or they don't feel comfortable com coming back to the workplace, I would encourage you to start thinking about how to deal with that. What kind of written policies can you put in place now to sort of anticipate that? and prepare for it. We are hearing some talk about potential retaliation and discrimination claims from some employees that may be working in the workplace still in the physical location and some employees that are working from home. And you wanna protect yourself. You wanna make sure you're doing things. And what, what I, I am finding is that a lot of business owners and leaders, they are trying to do the right thing. And sometimes even when you try to do the right thing, you can upset some people, unfortunately. So just making sure you're thinking about um, those employees or those coworkers that um, have the retaliation mindset or discrimination mindset um, in regards to your, your organization. And obviously start thinking about the impact of those employees. If you have some, unfortunately, that were laid off, what does that impact look? If you're looking to bring them back, what does that onboarding process look like um, in terms of policies and procedures and getting them ramped? Uh, ramped up. 
There also is some talk of those employees, and I think I mentioned this a few minutes ago, is those employees that are afraid to come back to work. You are going to have some employees um, that may be afraid, and it may be a phased approach. Now, if you're a business owner and you're looking at um, slowed revenue or decreased revenue, but you need that productivity back, and you have a set of employees that are afraid to come back, how do you deal with that, right? How do you deal with trying to ramp up your business, but you don't have the productivity because someone is afraid to come back to work? It's a very valid concern, but I would, I would ask you to start thinking about those dynamics so when that situation occurs, you are prepared for it. Um, we are finding that there are no policies in place or the wrong policies in place when it comes to working with, in, working with employees and bringing them back to work and how to deal with communicable, communicable diseases uh, in this pandemic during this, this virus. Now, how do you deal with that? No one thought that this would ever take place. And uh, it's no one's fault that you don't have a policy in place to deal with a pandemic or um, the coronavirus. That's not the issue. The issue is now, since we know that it's here, how do you deal with it effectively? and prepare yourself and protect your organization from, from risk associated with that. Legal, expo legal exposures, audit potential. Audit potential, what I'm getting at there is, um, if you have, have applied for the Paycheck Protection Act, um, Economic Injury Disaster Loan, some of these programs, they are wonderful programs to help your business and help you retain your headcount and your employees. The question is, do you have things documented that if an audit does come, come down the pike, are you prepared for that? Do you have the right documentation in place? Do you have the right vendor in place to provide some of the documentation to prepare your organization? So the last thing you need is to be dealing with regulations or mandates when you're trying to ramp, ramp up your revenue and bring your employees back, back to work. The last two things on this slide that we are counseling our clients, and I would encourage you to start thinking about, is a potential, and these are all potentials. Hopefully you don't have to deal with those, but the potential for workers' comp increases, injuries. Some valid, maybe some not so valid. You know, if you are dealing with a dynamic of an employee that really doesn't want to come back to work, they want to work from home still, um, don't be surprised if all of a sudden they get an injury. And if an injury happens at home, where no one saw it, how do you deal with it? You know, start thinking about those because obviously workers' comp claims has a direct impact on your premiums and your operating costs. And the last thing you need to deal with is increased operating costs when you're trying to ramp up your organization or ramp up your revenue or, or ramp up your customer base. So start thinking about, about these. And I'm gonna talk about best practices here, here, here in a little bit. And the last thing, I think we have, uh, a question come up, but the last thing I want to mention on this is, and there's not a lot of people talking about this as I listen to the news and I uh, read case studies and so forth, is the potential, the potential for medical claims increase. So if you are an organization that offer group medical plans, start planning for this, start talking to your brokers. And the reason I say that this is a risk is when I look, and I used to be a former broker, when I look at the dynamics, and I don't know if this is going to happen, but start thinking about this risk is increased costs on medical claims. Right now we have over 600,000 people that are um, coronavirus cases. That is 600,000 people, uh, unfortunately, that is in the healthcare system. And all the carriers have this increased expense. So the question becomes, is it less likely or more likely that for all of us, medical premiums will increase to deal with that? And I would venture to say, I'm going to guess that the potential is medical increases or medical premiums or medical costs will increase over time in response to this. Don't know that will happen, but I'm predicting that it will. So the question becomes, as an organization, and when you're looking at your balance sheets and you're looking at your customer base and you're trying to control your costs, the question becomes, how do, I, how do I protect myself from that? How do I plan for that? Um, and there are ways to do that. So um, when, I, when we look at different phases dealing with this virus, that is what 
I'm seeing in the marketplace and some of the challenges associated with that. So, Stephanie, questions in the chat? Uh, we did. There were two questions. Sure. Uh, Ron came from Rob. Yes, Rob. Uh, would the Ohio right to work protect employers? Say that one more time. I didn't hear it. I'm, I apologize. Would the Ohio right to work protect employers? It could. It could. And I think that is still yet to be determined. Um, that is, he, here's the thing that I find, and I have, I'm not an attorney, and I don't pretend to be one, and I do not want to give any type of accounting or finance or legal advice. So please don't take that away from that. But I do, I have worked in the legal community. Here's a challenge I see with business owners um, is the technical definition of right to work and what your rights are as an employer. You know, there's statutes, there's laws in the books. Here's a challenge I see a lot of businesses and owners dealing with is the, is the cost and the challenge to deal with an issue like that if it comes up. So you as a business owner or as, a, as an organization could be doing everything right, have the right intentions. You may be right in the in the in the eyes of the law but you could get um someone that follows a lawsuit that you now have to deal with so the specific answer to your question i don't know but i do know that if you do have a potential for litigation or have to deal with that or respond to it or act to it that's when you need to make sure you have the right partners the right attorneys the right um HR policies in place to deal with that in the event that question comes up and you have to deal with that. I hope that answers your question. It doesn't directly answer it, so I, cause I don't know, but I would encourage you to start having those conversations with your attorneys and be thinking about that as you put in policies and procedures in your place for, um, but very, very good question. So another question, Stephanie? There was another question from Barb. Sure. It yes, says, my office manager is receiving unemployment from her other job. She was working close to 40 hours a week. She will now be denied unemployment payment if she works more than 24 hours with me because she will be making too much money. She's concerned when I receive my PPP loan, will I need to up her hours? I don't want to deny her these funds as she is a single mother with two kids. Very, very good question, Barb. And I know... Um, we had talked before, and I, and I heard you on the webinar, I believe, um, with Congressman Gonzalez a couple of weeks ago. Um, I don't know the answer to that. I apologize. I, I do not want to lead you down, down the road. I, I do not know. Um, I would encourage you, some of these questions, I would highly encourage you to get with a uh, financial advisor and an accountant on those specific situations that impact your your specific employees and your specific business. Um, I do know that from the Paycheck Protection Act, um, if you are applying for some of the tax credits under the CARES Act, mm -hmm. and you are applying for the Paycheck Protection Act, is an either, is an either or. So I don't know if that answers your question directly. So there are some things you can't get on the CARES Act as far as tax credits for your mm -hmm. employees and also get um, the loan under the PPP. So just make sure you engage with a um, CPA or financial professional or yeah, yeah. a business banker to answer that specific questions um, regarding your specific situation. So, but, but good question. Any other questions? Okay, next slide please. Awesome. So again, as I'm talking to businesses, these, this is the state of affairs I see a lot of businesses in. And you may see this um, with respect to your particular situation. So I find businesses that are completely shut down, unfortunately. Um, I was talking to a really, really good client, client of mine, God, three weeks ago here in Cleveland, and they make uh, kitchen cabinets for uh, consumers. Um, he, he, he had three weeks of work orders, but after that, nothing. Um, and unfortunately, his employees had to go into people's homes, obviously, to install these cabinets. And he's completely devastated. And it was heartbreaking to listen to his story. He had been in business, I think, four, maybe five years. 
Um, but what he's going to do, he's a fighter. He's going to completely shut down. But once this is over, he's going to start over. Um, same industry, but he's going to start his business back. But this is, has, has taken a serious toll on businesses. So unfortunately, some businesses have shut down. A lot of businesses are dealing with layoffs and furloughs and so forth. They're dealing with those dynamics. Um, two, three, three and a half weeks ago, that this was prevalent as far as companies taking these, these type of actions. But when this reopens, um, businesses are going to, to ramp back up. They're going to need to rehire, obviously, their employees. So back to a couple of things I had talked about before, what does that look like? What, is, what are some of the challenges and things I need to be thinking about as an organization as I bring these employees back? And as I mentioned, how do I deal with someone that may not want to come back? So that is the other state of affairs that I see a lot of businesses in. The third one is where I see a lot, of, where I see most of the businesses in, where they just had a slowdown in revenue. Now, obviously, in my, this is not, um, this is business one-on-one, but when you have a slowdown in revenue, Obviously, I would encourage you to look at um, reducing operating expenses. And we're going to talk about that a little bit more. But as an example, we talked about the medical costs. So if you offer medical to your employees and benefits to your employees, prepare for that. You don't want to find yourself in a position where you have slowdown in revenue and it's going to take some time to ramp that revenue back up, but your operating costs are increasing. That is going to be a, 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 a horrible dynamic and you want to prepare yourself for that. Um, slow down in revenue. Uh, obviously, businesses are going to get to a point where they're going to need to increase productivity. And what does that look like? The third one there, the find new sources of revenue. We're going to talk about that in a little bit more on the next slide. So I would encourage you to start thinking about that if it's appropriate for your business. And not every business has the luxury of just say, hey, I, I, I can find a new source of revenue. I, I know it's not easy, but we're going to talk about that a little bit more to start maybe thinking about diversifying your revenue channels, diversifying your revenue sources to help protect yourself going forward in the, in the, in the future. Uh, a couple of businesses are static, status quo, uh, no impact, and they're business as usual, usual. Now, I find it, we're going to talk about here, this on, on the next slide, but there are some businesses where they are status quo, really haven't seen an impact but their supply chain is impacted. Uh, for example, I was talking to an owner of a uh, manufacturing company. They did metal stamping, and they work with steel. Their business is fine. They are struggling with their supply chain in, in the steel industry. Some of the workers were laid off and they're having a hard time getting their raw materials. So th while they are fine, their supply chain is not and they're having a backlog of orders um, and getting some of these orders finished and so forth. So uh, start thinking about your supply chain, your vendors, your raw materials, if you are in that industry. Um, if you are in, in an industry that is more business to consumer, you know, again, we're gonna talk about this a little bit more in the next slide, but think about how are you going to now engage with your consumers? not only as employees are afraid to get back to work, but you could have a segment of the consumer base that's afraid to shop with you or afraid to come into your store. Uh, and we're going to talk about that in a little bit more. And the last one here, I haven't seen this a lot where there's an increase in revenue, but if a business finds themselves fortunately in that, in that scenario, uh, we are finding that um, they're going to have a, a need to hire new staff. And what does that look like? And I have some ideas on the uh, on the next slide. So, any questions, Stephanie? Okay, awesome. Very good. I think Barb is leading the twenty five dollar gift card right now, right, Barb? So there you go. So feel free to ask your questions um, and engage. So best practices. What what do the next steps look like? What are some best practices and some ideas? So next slide. Okay, let's get into this. So crisis management plans, um, technology, and written business continuity plans. The technology I know for, for, for some businesses is a challenge, um, but making sure you have the right technology in place. And let me give you an, an example. When you talk about when I 
talk to clients about technology, there's business to business engagement, and then there's business to consumer engagement. Business to business engagement um, is one area. Business to consumer, when we're talking about technology, is more of an area that I would highly encourage you to take a look at. And let me give you an, an, an example. You wanna make sure that you have the best website and the technology in place and the bandwidth to handle traffic to engage with your consumers. What I mean by that is give a way for your consumers to pay for book appointments, engage with you through your website, through your website. And I'll give you an, an, an example. Um, I'm brainstorming here, but I give you, give you an example. Let's just say you're a heating and cooling company. Um, you're a heating and cooling company, and you may have a consumer that is a little bit afraid of you coming in, into their house and servicing their furnace. You know, you might want to think about, and I'm just brainstorming what is best for you, but you might want want to make sure you have a website that they could book an appointment and engage with you, and see your calendar and see availability right on your website. They can um, select a service order for their needs right on your, on your website. They can pay for their service, prepay for their service right on your website. And then you can, you can engage with them in regards to them coming into their home where there is no contact to do with their, whatever they need to do. Consumers will feel more comfortable potentially in doing business with you if you don't have that human to human interaction like we had 45 days ago. So just be thinking about things to how engage your consumers, consumers and engage your business to make sure that um, people feel more comfortable. That may take technology. That may take, that may take some investment to, investment to make sure you have the right tools and engagement tools and engagement strategies and how you communicate with your, um, with your customers in a completely different way. You know, we are, we are entering a potential of everything being virtualization. So the question becomes is, is your, is your business prepared for that? Is your business prepared to not only manage your employees remotely or virtually, but manage your consumers or your customers virtually? You know, are you on the cutting edge of that? And that may, making, uh, may be making sure you have the right technology in place. You have the right bandwidth and the tools in place to handle the, re the remote workforce. And more importantly, um, continuity plans. I remember after 9-11, and we all remember 9-11, is this became a big topic. And after time passed, we sort of, as an organization and as professionals, we got away from that. We got away from thinking about continuity plans and procedures and worst case scenarios. So I would encourage us to get back to that. And I give you a quick example. It could be something as, sim as simple as a succession plan. So I, as a business owner or CFO or an executive within the or organization or anyone for that matter, if I cannot do my job or something happens to me or I cannot work in the office but I have to work remotely, what is the second in command looks like? Who can, who can step in and do my job for me? And making sure that um, your customers are taken care of, people can pay their bills, people, you can do your accounts receivable. What does that succession plan look like in very, very difficult um, scenarios? So be thinking about that and ask yourself, do you have the right plans in place to, to deal with some of these challenges? I remember after 9-11, the big talk was not having all technology in one location. So you had servers being put up in different locations instead of some, in, in, in case something happened at one location, you can, you can continue op operating. We sort of got away from that. And one thing this crisis that I've, in my opinion, has taught us is to prepare, to prepare for continuity. Um, and is you cannot think of everything. I'm not suggesting that, but think about things that could happen. I give you another example, and I think we all remember, I think it was August of 2003, where the power went out everywhere in the East Coast. I think it was three or four days. Power went out. 
You know, if that were to happen, can your business operate? Operate. I think one of the, the, the blessings from this virus is even though we had social distance, distancing, we still had technology, we still had electricity, we still had power. So in some instances, we could still communicate. But the question I challenge is, what if we didn't have electricity or technology or email or websites? You know, that would have been even more devastating. So start thinking about some of those things and planning and engaging, engaging with experts to sort of help, uh, help with some of those ideas. So questions, Stephanie? Um, there weren't really questions. There were just some comments. Okay. Um, so Kim from Jean um, said she's thankful that you used the HVAC situation for her. She appreciates that. Oh, good. Um, but she also said that they are looking at options for virtual appointments and equipment replacement proposals. Perfect. And then Susan Russell said um, everything that you've said makes sense. She just had a medical issue and the virtual platform Oh, hang on one second. Sorry. The the virtual platform made made her more willing to complete an office visit. She probably would have postponed it had it not been for the virtual visit, making her aware awesome. of it, that it was important for her not to postpone. Awesome. There you go. That's perfect. Uh, then there was one more that just came up from Barb. It says a comment. Uh, mm -hmm. She's considered an essential service providing pet boarding daycare and in-home yeah. visits. Mm -hmm. Her kennel is at 50% revenue and in home is pretty much wiped out. Yeah. She's been thinking outside the box for different services that she can provide, like providing pet taxis. She can bring pet supplies and meds to the shut ins and take pets to vet visits. And she's constantly utilizing her Facebook page and website to let people know that she's still open and offering these new services. Awesome. Yeah. Yeah, some, some, and th those are really, really good ideas. So I'm glad we're thinking about, man, how do I deal with this? How do I, you know, this is a great opportunity to look and shake up how we may have done business in the past. Shake it up and be bold. You know, really think how, and it may take an investment in technology. It will re require us to think about and engage with, e with, with each other a little bit differently. But man, it is a good opportunity to look at streamlining efficiencies and virtual virtualization, technology, engaging with our clients on the website. You know, ask yourself the question, the question, how can I make my consumers more comfortable in doing business with me? How can I make my customers more, the process more efficient? How can I, how can I deliver goods and services and professional services um, remotely. You know, those are very, very, and I'm not suggesting that those questions are easy, but it's something we need to start thinking about and having, being, being at the forefront of some of these ideas, and I love some of the ideas and suggestions, will make you stand out with your competitors and even some of the larger organizations, employers out there. So really, really good stuff. Really good stuff. Um, some of those ideas, was that it, Stephanie? I'm sorry, was that it? Uh, there was one more from Susan. She said, yes. this is giving her ideas for launching her personal training visit in her home. Yes. But she can also do a virtual training for some of the customers. Awesome. Who is that again? I'm sorry, I missed the name. Uh, Susan Russell. Susan, Susan. Love that. Um, and I hope I'm not... Um, saying, saying a competitor, but Peloton. Peloton is so uh, popular right now. And I love that idea is now you can bring your expertise, your personal training directly to the homes of your, of your consumers. They will feel comfortable in do, doing business with you. They can pay for their services. They can book appointments. They can view, you know, get to a system to where you have the technology to where they could see your calendar and see available appointments right on your website and book it right on your website and then have the video just like we have now to engage a consult, counsel them. Um, that, I mean, that is fantastic. So yes, webcams, virtualization, engaging with websites is where we are going. And um, I love that. So thank you for the comments.
good ideas. I love these ideas and suggestions. So the second, the second bullet point, I hope I didn't miss anything. The second bullet point is again, watch your supply chain. Again, this is easier to do for some businesses than others. I get it. But start thinking about if your primary source of revenue were to go away today, what would that look like? And ask yourself the question, do you have an alternative? And if you do, what is that alternative and how do you implement it? You know, if you are relying on suppliers for your raw materials or your equipment or what your consumers are looking for, if that were to go away, what impact would that have on your organization? So diversify your suppliers is something that a lot of businesses are going to instead of having everything in one basket. If you have new sources of revenue, diversify that. And we're going to talk about that a little bit more because if you are fortunate, fortunate enough to diversify your raw materials and your suppliers and your consumers, that may bring on new demands for your employees. It's going to bring on new demands for a particular skill set. So then you have a question is, if I diversify and do some of the things that Don is talking about or I'm putting in place, do I have the right skill set and the right employees to fill that and service that, right? I may not, if my revenue is slow and I diversify, I may not be in a position from a budget standpoint to hire new employees and grow headcount. Head How do I do more with the same amount of employees and diversify my, my offerings? And we do, I'm going to talk about that here, here in a little bit. But watch your supply chain, your, your supply chain and diversify your suppliers. Legislation, seeking advice. Um, I would encourage you, do not do this alone. It's going to be that simple. Um, engage with your accountant. Engage with your attorney. Talk to your business banker. Um, you can talk to me for what we do here at Shakely, talk to the Chamber of Commerce, but seek advice from the professionals um, that has expertise. Don't try to do this stuff alone. Not only is, go is it going to suck up a lot of your time in trying to interpret all of the legislation, the Paycheck Protection Act, all of these loans and so forth, they are fantastic, don't get me wrong, but you can spend a lot of time trying to figure this stuff out um, but engage with the professional, the professionals, engage with a hire a firm that has expertise. There are options out there that you may not know exist. And a true expert in a true firm, good firm that handles these type of issues, um, that is going to be something I will highly recommend uh, instead of you having to do it yourself. Um, you're going to spend a lot of time on things you should be doing in regards to uh, strategic planning, diversifying your supply chain, looking for new customers, implementing technology, that kind of thing. So when it comes to legislation, things you need for your business, don't do it alone. Engage with, uh, with, with some expertise. Um, the fourth thing is identify weak points in your critical processes and your services. Here's what I talk about with this, a couple of thoughts on this. I want to make sure I'm respectful on your time. Really consider cross-training your employees, particularly those who are in critical roles and responsibilities. I think as a business society over the last 40 or 50 years, we have put in place some of these systems to where this is Don's job and that is all Don is going to do. And over a period of time, Don really gets good at what, whatever he does. I think we are entering a phase to where employees are going to have to be cross-trained and cross-trained their expertise. Let me give you an example. Um, I, just, I just give a manufacturing firm um, as an example. You could have a person that may be working in a warehouse or in a plant. They are a key employee you may want to consider taking that employee and they may have some 
business skills, some finance skills, maybe some sales skills that you can bring them and train them on some of these skills. There are online learning management tools out there where they can take classes, professional classes, where you can cross train them. If you are responsible for payroll processing, for example, I'll just give an example. If you are responsible for, responsible for payroll processing and only you are doing payroll, it may be a good idea to teach someone else to do that in case something were to happen to you. Maybe your plate is too full. Another employee can do that. Uh, maybe you want to take an employee and have them make calls to your existing customers or make calls to prospective customers, but teach them the customer service skills that they may need. I can tell you that employees want this. Um, I would encourage you, if you have a set of employees that are not uh, in the past engaged with technology, they may not like email, they may not have an iPhone, I would rethink and, and encourage those employees to sort of get with it, to be honest with you, um, and train them on technology, train them on word processing skills, train them on customer service and using the phone. Cross train your employees is where we, you are going to get a bigger bang for your buck, but there are online learning management systems. I know at Shakely, that's what we counsel our clients on. And we have some technology that helps with this, where you can put them through an online training you can test them and certify them in, the, in different areas. I would encourage you to take a look at that and say, what key roles do I have within my, what key needs do I have within my organization? And can I take one, two, five, 10, 15 employees and cross train them into, into different areas? That is becoming a big focus. Another thing I would encourage you to take a look at is, or think about is over the weekend, Saturday, I believe, I was talking to a business owner um, on LinkedIn from the state of Washington. He owns 40 different car washes. So he applied for his paycheck protection. He got approved and he, are, he is now bringing his employees back. But here's the challenge. He's bringing the employees back and they don't have the, uh, the work demand anymore. So they're basically sitting around. So his dilemma is, I have this headcount that I need to maintain, but what the heck do they do, right? Revenue is down, but he has these employees. And one of the things he's considering and we're talking about is um, providing some online learning management tools to help train and cross-train his employees. They're taking safety classes online. They're taking workers' comp classes online. They're taking some business skills online while they deal with this. So there's something, there's, um, that is something else to sort of think about and consider as you're going through this. Um, and again, we talked about the other bullet point is prepare for um, a reduced amount of human to human or person to person interaction. And we talked a little bit about that. I thought I saw a question come up. Uh, yeah, there's been a couple comments. Okay. Uh, let's go backwards. Um, Susan Russell again, she said her primary job is with Cornerstone and we have been providing care virtually. This environment may provide an opportunity to seek more clients as the anxiety and depression triggered by yeah. COVID-19. Yeah. Even if she can find a way to offer brief free sessions with clients. Love that. Um, and then Barb, uh, she said she's going to put a virtual greeting on her website that she wants to ensure that her facility has been practicing um, appropriate safety protocol for COVID-19. Yes. She wants to let them know that they have a clean and safe environment and encourage them to contact her with concern. Awesome, love that Barb, Susan, good stuff. And then here's a little bit of a different one. This is from Jenny Sagan. Hey Jenny. She said she's in a little bit of the opposite scenario. Okay. She's an office manager of a small business and she has a hand in just about every aspect of the business, but she has an owner who has not been considering what changes will come out of this pandemic. She's not sure how to convey the changes that they need to make to their business for both their customers and employees. Yeah, yeah. Jenny, um, that's a really good question. And I know you, you know, I'm, I'm working with you and, and so forth, so I appreciate that. Th that is a challenge. The challenge, 
I see is to take these ideas and suggestions and have, have it adopted and accepted throughout the organization. That's it's, the bottom I, line. That's the I bottom think, line. Yeah. I'm sorry. Yeah. I'm sorry. I just think it's, it's yeah. a little bit of an uphill battle. Yeah. Um, I know I have the employees on our side, on my side. Yep. Um, they all feel the changes that are going to need to be made. It's just conveying that to the upper management as far as I know I have employees that are nervous about coming back, even when things are starting to open up. And I think we need to ease into this as right. a, as a business on, right opening up um our you know our business isn't going to ramp up immediately for multiple reasons um it's just trying to convince uh the upper management the owners that these are the steps that for safety um that we need to to do and it, it's been a little bit of a difficult struggle i know i know <laughs> Now you make a really good point if, if i could maybe just point uh give you some su suggestions this, gonna, this is going to take a while. Let me give you an example. We have 10 minutes. Let me give you an, an example. I just give you an, an example on human resources. Okay. I am trying, I am trying hard not to use the word human resources anymore, anymore going forward. And I'll tell you why. If you remember history class, high school, it used to not be human resources. It used to be the personnel department. Remember that? The personnel manager, the office of personnel. Everyone was a cog in a wheel, you know, personnel. And I think right around the late 80s, early 90s, we get into this human resources arena. And that's where we are now. It took a shift of people decades to change their mindset from employees being considered personnel to now human resources, right? They took decades to change that mindset. Now we're in this human resources arena and I, I don't think it's human resources anymore. And I'm trying to force, I've been working in HR, human resources for, for so long. It even takes me time to change that mindset set. There is no more human resources. This is coming from Don, okay? It is employee engagement now. We are in an employee engagement environment. Human resources used to be the days of, I'm gonna do payroll, I may do an employee handbook, and human resources is where all the problems go. That's where all the complaints go. That's where people get fired. We're over that. That is no longer human resources. Human resources are being forced to go into strategic planning and employee engagement. Now, some may be thinking, Don, that's a play on words. I don't think it is. I think that it's going to take a time, it's going to take some time for owners and executives to get into the mindset of employee engagement and strategic planning, but they're gonna be forced to. Why? The market is going to demand it because your competitors are going to shift to that. Those companies, in my opinion, that shift to virtualization, engagement, a different way of thinking, a different way of taking care of their employees, that's going to drive the market. And Jenny, to your question, I think that's gonna drive a different way of thinking. I, I would encourage you to maybe, if you have some of these ideas, and if you can, quantify those, meaning, meaning put a business or a financial number to what you are trying to do and what you're trying to accomplish and give them ideas of how to reduce their cost and what is the business impact um, to some of the things you're thinking about, um, if that helps. Sometimes, you know, numbers speak louder than words. They really do. So, but, but your point is completely valid. It may take some time, but the consistent, persistent pursuit of driving that message and why some of these changes need to be made, we, I think we're all gonna get there eventually. So, but good point. I'm running out of time. I don't want to be respectful of everyone's um, time. We're going to, we're going to um, at the end, take questions and, and answers. The technology, I thought we, we covered that. But the last thing I will mention on technology, whether it's payroll processing, the days of doing payroll in-house, 
I would encourage you not to do that anymore. I don't know. It's too complicated. You can be doing more revenue producing things than payroll. And that's just an example. We talked about the communication channels, but look at things you're doing manually today, whether it's engaging with your employees, hiring your employees, engaging with your customers, having your customers pay for your products and services. You know, if that's a manual process, sit down on a piece of paper and say, how can I automate that? How can I make it uh, more virtual? So take your manual processes and automate that. The great thing about this virus is we are in an, it happened in an age where there's technology available. My goodness, could you imagine this virus happened in 1992 as an example with no technology in place? I mean, it would have been absolutely catastrophic. So there are technologies out of place, very affordable options, um, but make sure you look at your manual processes and, and automate some of this, this stuff. Next slide, please. Okay, I'm gonna run through this for the sake of time. We have about six minutes. So another best practices is on the increased profitability, reduced liability and strategic goals. I think we talked a lot about the profitability, uh, looking at ways to op uh, lower your operating costs, look at your, your cost of insurances, medical workers comp, et cetera, and look and see are there ways to reduce those or get, get better. Um, I know this is something that at Shakely we talk to our clients about is there are other um, group medical options when it comes to medical and workers comp as an example at a much lower price point and we have some strategies with that. So look at that, whether Shakely or someone else, I would encourage you to look at all your options. The way of doing business in the past, even 45 days ago, there's a, there's a, there's a, there's a change. Repurpose staff we talked about. Reduce liability, we talked about, engage and leverage experts. This is what they do. The strategic goals we talked about, cross-training your employees. Bullet point, bullet point number two on here, watch for mental stress. And I think maybe Susan had mentioned this a little bit. Provide support and programs for your employees. This is becoming a challenge. And when I looked at the SHRM statistics, Society of Human Resources Management, you know, 61% say their productivity is impacted by their mental health. You know, and 37% of those contribute the working environment as a factor to mental health and mental stress. Now, those were staggering numbers. So ask yourself the question, particularly during this virus, do you have the right support programs in place for your employees? You know, very difficult conversations to have, but there's very, very affordable programs out there um, that can assist with that. And working from home, there are some employees that do not want to work from home and they're lost. And that is causing some mental stress and some mental health issues. So, um, okay, I think a lot of these we've talked about. Next slide, I think is time for Q&A. Okay, very good. So any questions, any thoughts, um, Stephanie, as we wrap up? Uh, there was a suggestion by Teresa for Jenny. She said okay. perhaps a springboard to the conversation with the owner is the guidelines that the governor and board of health will impose. Take those state mandated recommendations and ask what additional precautions on top of those recommendations will we A, uh, need to make for your employees to feel comfortable enough to return to work and B, make your customer comfortable enough to do business with the company. Yeah. Good, thank you for that, that's awesome. Um, and then the last comment that just came in, um, Barb agrees with Teresa, and she said exactly that's what she will be attempting with her virtual greeting. Um, I, she has the advantage is that she's the owner of the business, so she's able to implement as she sees fit. Yeah. She said she has an employee who she thinks is afraid to work. Uh, I think the greeting will help him fill at ease as well. Yeah. And then Colleen Flowers has a question. She says, thoughts on the timeline of businesses reopening? <laughs> uh, uh, um, thoughts on the timeline of, I'm trying not to get political or anything. That's not what we want to do. Um, I think it's going to be a challenge on this, on, on, on a timeline for businesses. 
um, depending on some of the guidelines that's going to come from the federal government and um, Governor DeWine, I think we'll, we'll prov provide a framework of how businesses should then react, in my view. I think we should probably wait to see what some of those frameworks and guidelines are from the federal government and the state of Ohio, and then see how you can best fit that strategy that best fits your particular organization. You have to keep your employees safe and you have to be start thinking about that now, today, of how you engage with and bring your employees back. Now, I think every bit is going to be a little bit different for every business. It's going to depend on your um, demands on interacting with customers. So someone in a restaurant is going to have completely different needs than someone that's maybe a technology company. You know, consider any type of company travel requirements that your company has. Who knows when people are gonna, is gonna feel comfortable in traveling again. So if you have a business that's demanding business travel or if you have clients in other states that you have to visit and engage with, you know, that could take some time. So I think it's going to, we're gonna get some guidelines and some requirements, federal and state-wise, but I think you have to tailor them and start thinking about how that best, best fit your organization. So. Who knows on the time timeline? Um, so, yeah, good question. Her follow-up question was, do you feel they will come out with clear guidelines quickly once that happens? Yes, I do. I mean, I think the president is even talking about issuing some guidelines today, I believe. Um, so I do think at least within the next few days, in my view, um, we're gonna start getting a sense of what the federal government is thinking, what the CDC, is coming out with, uh, what the state of Ohio is coming out with. You know, if you look around some of the, there's some regional plans. So New York, Rhode Island, uh, Pennsylvania, and some others, they are joining together to come up with a plan. Then you have the state of Washington, California, Oregon. They are coming out with some of their plans. So what I see is regionally. Now how Ohio fits into that, I'm not quite sure yet. Um, but I do think in a matter of days, not weeks, we're going to get some of that framework. Uh, and then I encourage you to uh, start thinking about how that be best fit your organization. But start thinking today. If you want to reach out to me um, directly on a one-on-one -on -one conversation and bounce some ideas off of me, we can talk through some of this. We can talk about some of the things that Shakely does. We can talk about some of the things that the Chamber does. My contact inf information is on the screen now. So feel free to reach out to me if you have any questions, want to talk about things. Be more than happy to provide some one-on-one uh, -on -one guidance, um, no cost um, to that. So, um, Alyssa just posted a question. She said, yeah. do you have any suggestions for businesses currently hiring and who will continue to hire as things open up? As a hiring coordinator for an essential business, I am already finding candidates who are unemployed now yeah. But I am afraid they will jump back to their previous company as soon as they are able. Yeah. Yeah. Here's my suggest suggestion on that. Figure out the, the, kind, the kind of candidate and employee that you want that will fit your long-term strategic goals. But before you hire them, really think about the tools that you need to provide that candidate. I am a big believer if you give new hires and candidates and employees avenues for learning, engagement, the cross training, um, those type of tools and provide those resources for them to do their job and it may take an investment in technology, the happier they seem to be with your organization and the longer they tend to, to stay with your organization if you're providing them that, those tools. But have a clear understanding of what are your, your key critical factors for your business? Do you have the right staff in place to fulfill those positions, right? And if not, if you are hiring for some of those needs, are you providing the right tools and resources um, so they can be successful in their job um, using technology and online learning management tools and so forth? So very good question. But feel free to call me if you wanna talk through that more. There's a lot there when you're talking about recruiting 
Um, and I do have some other ideas, but for the sake of time, that's a really good question, but there's a lot involved in, into that. So feel free to reach out to me one-on-one -on -one and we can talk through that more. So good stuff. Anything else, Stephanie? I wanna be respectful of everyone's time. Um, uh, no, I just posted in the chat that um, I would be happy to send a copy of the slides to everyone. Yes. Um, mm -hmm. And then we did record this. So if all goes well, we'll have a audio and video recording of this as well. Perfect. And the next slide we can end here. There is a um, virtual business. I think it is, what is it, Stephanie? A business after business? Yeah, it was on the prior slide. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Yeah. No, it's okay. Um, we're doing a virtual business after business on Tuesday, April 28th from 3.30 right. to 5. Um, it's listed on our website. If you are interested in registering, uh, there's registration information there. So we're doing a little spin off of our normal business after business. So we're hoping to have a fun and engaging evening. So join us uh, if you can. Awesome. Well, everyone, I, again, I want to be respectful of your time. Thank you so much. I really appreciated the good questions, the good comments. There were some really, really good ideas that was talked about in this group. And I really appreciate that engagement. I will be, uh, I think this is being recorded. So we'll go back through the chats and so forth and um, give out that, that $25 gift card. I will reach out to the lucky winner and determine what restaurant you want to uh, order from, obviously carry out, and we'll get that mailed out to you. So I really appreciate all of the thoughts and comments. Hopefully you found this helpful. Um, I enjoy talking about this stuff. I enjoy helping my clients through this. I wish you all health and safety and um, have a great day. So thank you. Thanks everyone.